Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks to the witnesses for being here. Ms. Gaines, I want to start with you. Thank you for your courage in being here today. Thank you for your courage and advocacy for women. You have been subjected to an unbelievable amount of abuse. You talk about intimidation, threats of violence. You have suffered it. I want to put up here a, a picture so everybody can see it. This was the welcome you were treated to at San Francisco State University just a couple of months ago when a, a mob assembled where you were supposed to speak, I believe for over three hours, screamed, threatened you, barricaded you in a room. Do I have that basically correct? Yes, I was held for ransom for three and a half hours um, by hundreds of these protesters, as you see on the board. Um, they demanded that I had to pay them money if I wanted to make it home to see my family safe again. The law enforcement in San Francisco, um, I respect and I think law enforcement is what's brave, not me, and I respect all law enforcement, but what the law enforcement I was met with in San Francisco, in my opinion, failed miserably in effectively doing their job. Um, they had mentioned that it was not ideal for them to be seen as anything other than an ally to this community, um, and that was made very obvious in the treatment and effectiveness of, of removing me safely from that situation. Why were you threatened and barricaded into a room and held for ransom for hours on end? I mean, what, what was it you were saying that was so, so terrible? I was invited to speak on my experience of my senior year in competing against a male. Um, nothing opinionated about what I shared. It was surely the exact lived experience of what me and my teammates and fellow competitors dealt with. And so I spoke, I, after my speech, there was of course a lot of protesters in the room, which I'm totally fine with people protesting, it's their right to protest, but what I'm not fine with is when it does turn violent in the way that it did. Because protesters afterwards, they rushed into the room, they turned off the lights, they rushed to the front, um, myself and others were assaulted, and that's ultimately when I was held for hostage for three and a half hours. This is unbelievable, unbelievable. Uh, thank you for your courage in the midst of that. Let's talk a little bit about the message that you were sharing, and you started to talk about it in your opening statement. Just tell us about your experience, because nobody can question your experience. I don't think anybody sitting at the, at, at the table, and certainly nobody at this podium, has had uh, the experience that you have had. You were talking about just the incredible surprise, shall I say, to put it gently, of finding a biological man, a six foot four biological man in your locker room and having to accept that without being asked about it, without being told about it even. What was that like for you? Tell us about that. I, again, we only became aware we would be undressing next to a man was when we had to see a man undressing while we were simultaneously undressing. And so I immediately left the locker room and I went up to one of the officials on the pool deck and I said, what are the guidelines to allow a man into our locker room? I know the guidelines for the competition, but what are the guidelines for the locker room? And he so nonchalantly said back, oh, we actually got around this by making locker rooms unisex. And so I'm thinking to myself in these brief moments, first and foremost, you just admitted this is a male by acknowledging how you had to change your rules to make the locker rooms unisex. You acknowledge that we do not share the same sex, first and foremost. Secondly, unisex? Any man could have walked into our locker room, any coach, any official, any man who wanted to would have had full reins to and bare minimum we weren't forewarned about it. And that's, that's the traumatizing part. Of course, the experience in and of the locker room itself is traumatizing, but I think for me, it was so easy for them to dismiss our rights to privacy. Um, Senator Durbin, in, in your opening statement, you had mentioned this rhetoric. It's, um, you had mentioned that, what message does it send to trans individuals? And my combat to that is what message does this send to women, to young girls who are denied of these opportunities? So easily their rights to privacy and safety thrown out of the window to protect a small population, protect one group as long as they're happy? What about us? That is the overall general consensus of how we all felt in that locker room. Why do you, why do you think it is that the, the NCAA and so many people in power seem intent on just erasing your opinion, your views, the whole category of women. I noticed that recently you just posted this to social media about a message that Harvard was sending around, I think, to its swimmers telling them, don't talk about Leah Thomas, don't share your opinions. If you get contacted by a member of the media, then refer that to the university. Don't say anything, for heaven's sake. Tell us about this. I mean, this has been your experience over and over and over. You're told as a woman to shut up, don't say anything. What's that like? 
that is continually happening. And if we do speak up, you're immediately labeled as some, as some name. They will call you everything under the sun, whether it's transphobic, homophobic, racist, white supremacist, domestic terrorist, they will throw them all at you in hopes to deter you, in hopes to silence you. Um, Leah Thomas's teammates, they were forced every single week to go to mandatory LGBTQ education meetings to learn about how just by being cisgender, they were oppressing Leah Thomas. They were told that they're not allowed to take a stance because their school has already taken their stance for them. They were told that you will never get a job, you will never get into grad school, you will lose your friends, you will lose your scholarship and playing time if you speak out. They told these girls that if you do speak out, and any harm whatsoever comes towards Thomas's way, whether that's through social media, whether that's physical, mental, emotional harm, then you are solely responsible and you could be responsible for a potential death. And you don't want that, do you? Of course not. Who would ever want to be responsible in a potential death? But that is the emotional blackmail that is plaguing this country, especially in universities. Last question, and I'll, just, I'll ask this and then give you a chance to respond, and I'm, I'm done with this, Mr. Chairman. Um, let me give you a chance to respond to something that Leah Thomas said recently, publicly. This is, um, she said this publicly. They're using, this quote now, they're using the guise of feminism, they meaning you, using the guise of feminism to sort of push transphobic beliefs, meaning you advocating for women, women's rights, is actually just a cover for transphobia. Do you want to respond to that? Feminism is not a fluid term. Um, the original and, and the meaning of what it means to be a feminist is to uphold, respect, honor, embrace, and celebrate women on our own physical ceilings, our own uniqueness. That term has not changed. Um, and what this really is is a, is a male mansplaining what it is to be a feminist, which I honestly think is pretty ironic, and it's something we've seen before. Thank you, Senator Hawley. Uh, 